I'm joined by Stephen Kirkjian, author of Master Thieves. He's here today to talk to us a little bit about the most famous art heist in U.S. history. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I think today, you know, what a lot of people are wondering is, do you think these pieces will ever be recovered? Even though it has been 25 years later, um, and there has been uh, endless hours of investigative work and commitment, man and women power put to this case, I do, in fact, am optimistic. Uh, I am optimistic uh, not because um, someone, is going to, I, I, someone is going to finally realize that there is no better offer that can be made. The FBI U.S. Attorney's Office, who's in charge of this investigation, has said you will not be prosecuted if you bring in the artwork. Bring it back. Um, you will not be prosecuted, and there is an existing crime of possession of stolen property, and we will uh, bring you to the museum, which has a $5 million offer outstanding for this artwork. Well, that offer has been on the table for at least eight years, and it has not gotten a single, substantive, credible contact. So in doing this book, in reconstructing the crime as best I could tell uh, with reporting, reporting in many ways learned here at Boston University, um, I came up with another theory. I came up with another approach. And that uses, I believe, some of the modern technology of the digital age, crowdsourcing. And uh, crowdsourcing to a great degree was responsible for the uh, for the uh, capture of James Whitey Bulger, and more importantly, what took place last summer. Everyone knew about the ice bucket challenge because of crowd crowdsourcing. And I thought the way to get people to understand and feel the loss that th the artwork that has been stolen and is still missing for 25 years, to feel that loss, not as a mystery, not as a criminal case, but as a loss of our culture. This is, these, these paintings, three or four of them are absolute masterpieces. The only seascape that Rembrandt ever painted, only time he ever painted the sea, was in a painting that was stolen from the, from the Dutch room of the Gaga Museum. The only Vermeer that we had here in New England, only one, stolen from in this theft. That is our cultural history. That is a part of our common wealth, yet we don't feel it. In the way I think to get those people who know something about where, who was responsible, or where the artwork, more importantly, where the artwork might be, is to appeal to their brighter angels, better angels, is to appeal to that's a loss to your family, to your children and your grandchildren. So make a call. Call the FBI. It's not going to be publicly known. They treat everything confidentially. If you don't cannot, if you don't trust whatever the authorities, call a reporter. Call Steve Kirkjian. Everyone's sole aim here now, 25 years later, is to get that artwork back on the wall. So what I thought would be a, a way of um, putting out that appeal is get the leaders of our community, Mayor Walsh credible biography. Um, Cardinal O'Malley, he gets into people's souls, into their hearts better than anyone. Tom Brady and David Ortiz, they helped us recover from the, the, the marathon bombing. Get those men in front of, get those individuals in front of this, these empty frames at the Dutch room. Of the, and I think we, the city, those people who may know something will get uh, stirred and feel sympathy and understand that this is a loss for all time. They have to pick up the phone and let the FBI know where this material is in. So now the statute of limitations has run out on the actual theft itself. Yes. What do you think the goal is behind continuing the investigation and, and what do people hope to gain from solving? Well, even though the theft itself is the statute has told, uh, that was told after five years. I think Sen uh, Senator uh, 
uh, Ted Kennedy working with uh, the museum, uh, the Israel Stuart Gardner Museum director, uh, Ian Hawley, uh, and other museum uh, directors put in place afterwards a, a change in that statute so that a theft of muse from a museum is a, can be prosecuted for 20 years. Not for the Gardner because it's after the fact that the change was made after the theft. But you can still be prosecuted for possession of stolen property. So if someone is holding them, which is not a theory that I hold, uh, I don't think anybody knows exactly the whereabouts. They do know rumors, suggestions, innuendo. And that's the, it's that information that put together with what the, the FBI has assembled uh, as far as a case file, I think we could find out pretty quickly where the material, whom they're talking about and where the material might be. Um, however, if there is someone who knows about it, knows the exact where, and is holding it, possessing it, those people are responsible for possession of stolen property. They could be apprehended, prosecuted, sent away for a very long time, and be, and in, in, fa in fact, be seen as the scoundrels of our city, of our region. I say, tell them, appeal to their consciences, get them to be the princes and the princesses of the city. Tell us, tell the authorities where that material is so we can gain that, get, get that artwork back on the wall. There is no, to me, at this point, 25 years later, the, the material was not stolen so some art collector or art appreciator could not, who could not live without seeing, having uh, the Rembrandt, any of, either the three Rembrandts or the Vermeer on his wall. I think it was stolen in order to begin a, an exchange with the authorities to make a plea deal with one of their associates. And the last chapter of my book talks about a scenario that makes pretty good sense to me. But we have to reach their, we have to br uh, reach their consciences. And their conscience, the way I think of reaching their consciences is that the, the reason that what was stolen from is long past. Whatever deal you are hoping to make, that's all, all over. Um, so you get that material back so we can appreciate it. And you can maybe get the art, maybe get the, um, get a piece of the reward, or all the reward. I think the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office is willing to make any concession to any uh, person who knows it, that their identity will never be known, but the reward of their putting up their hand, pointing out where in the, in the geography this, this material might be, will be, um, will be appreciated by anyone who goes back and sees these paintings on the wall. Now, this remains one of the FBI's 10 longest unsolved art crimes. Very much. What do you think it is about this particular theft that has made it so hard for the FBI to solve? Uh, when there is uh, a great art stolen, it does usually take, unless there's a, an arrest made within 48 hours, you know, f some forensic evidence is left behind, um, it does usually take a matter of years to solve. In this case, what I think happened is the individuals who were responsible for the actual theft, two or three, that's all who knew about it. It wasn't knowledge within a gang. It was knowledge only amongst the two or three who pulled, in that gang who pulled it off. There's no honor among these thieves. Uh, they keep their, what they're called scores, they keep that to themselves because if another associate in the gang knows about it, he or she could drop a dime on them and get some reward. So my sense is that these individuals who did the actual theft uh, and, and hid the material, either giving it to a person who hid it for them or hid it themselves. Don't forget, there were 45 FBI agents on the streets of Boston uh, trying to track the trail. I think that must have, uh, uh, that must have, uh, you know, the front page news. Every newscast was leading with it. I think that probably startled them, and they said, let's let things cool down. So they put the material away. They hid it. They're in a dangerous business. 
as being members of these gangs. There was a gang war going on in Boston in the late 80s through the early 90s. And this took place in March of 1990. The men who stole it, my belief is, is they're in the middle of a gang war. There was lots of people on both soldiers on both sides of this war, both families that were fighting, excuse me, both gangs that were fighting that were casualties. And my sense is that these individuals, the two or three, suffered the fate of, of others in their uh, gangs and were killed. And with them, I think, just it's logic more than hard reporting, um, that, um, that they died, they were killed. But their kin, their associates, they have some inkling. They have some um, uh, inkling is more suspicion that they were involved. And those are the people who on, on any other day, on any other year, and on any other anniversary say, why should I get involved? You know, I'll be bothering somebody else's uh, um, uh, uh, treasure. You know, somebody else's score. Why should I get involved? Well, I think we have to address that issue, why should they get involved with. The reason why you should get involved is the generations, your children, grandchildren, are going to lose out in seeing these masterworks. So you've touched on it a little bit, but you know, our nation and even the city of Boston has plenty of unsolved crimes. What do you think it is about this theft that makes it so important that we solve it? Well, like I say, it's... Um, I, I, I've, 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 stoke, I've, I've spoken about the, uh, the, um, the importance and the beauty of the, of the masterpieces themselves. Uh, but for me, uh, a Boston boy um, who has seen this city change so remarkably to when I was growing up and going to public schools here, that has become such a thriving, diverse, uh, world-class city. To think that we could get these masterpieces back for the right reason that someone brings them back. It seems to me to be a crowning achievement. It makes us, you know, I, you know I'm a hard, hard reporter. I go, a, I've been, you know, my career at the Globe, go after, with investigative reporting, all sorts of um, uh, criminality and waste and uh, corruption of the public money. But with those artwork, that artwork back in the wall, I think we are an Olympian city. I think it would, it would restore, it would give us a confidence, give us a pride uh, that we've gotten back our masterpieces. Understand, go to the Boston Public Library, stand up in front of the entrance on Dartmouth Street. You will see two major statues, one of scientific and one of artistic achievement. On the base of the artistic achievement statue, there are eight names of artists throughout history, throughout, into BC. Six of those artists have their works shown at the Gardner Museum. There's no other museum anywhere in this area that has six of those, any, that, that, number, that number of artists of their work shown at the museum. That to me says that this is a special place. It's a, uh, it is a special place, not just for our artistic achievement, but also a special center for the city. And we want it to be made whole, and it will not be made whole until that artwork is back. Now, I don't want to spoil anything that you have in the book here, but do you have a theory as to who you think committed the crime? You'll have to read the last chapter. Uh, what I think best that I came up with is a motive that, for the first time, has been identified with individuals. And that was there was a, crime, uh, there was a gang war going on in the leader of one of the gangs, uh, had just recently been arrested two or three months before the theft. And what he was told by one of his associates while he was in prison, uh, waiting indictment, which happened, and uh, sentencing, which happened, to me is a very, very important clue. And now has the FBI reached out to you at all with the release of the book? Uh, do you think it'll help aid in their investigation? I, in the, the new material that I, th that I gained in the book, uh, from my reporting on the book, uh, certainly the first chapter and this uh, Dickens-like character um, who had the first idea for breaking into the museum and why he had it. 
in what gang he told about it, uh, about that idea and the value of the, of the artwork inside. Uh, I long ago told the FBI about him in my interviewing with him. And on the latest one, just, just as I began writing that chapter, the last chapter, uh, I went sat down with Anthony Amori and Jeff Kelly. The Jeff is the FBI agent on the case, and Anthony Amori is the investigator for the, uh, the museum and told them exactly what I had told. And I told the individual. And, you know, in dealing with stories like this, they're very um, sensitive, and you've got to proceed very carefully. And for a reporter, uh, the way to do it carefully is tell the individual whom you are interviewing, whether it's on the authority side or the bad, word, bad guy side, what you want and why it's in their best advantage to talk to, to talk to me. It's what we do as reporters, whether it's for TV or general assignment or investigative. You know, be honest with people and work hard in figuring out how you can convince someone what's in it for them to tell you a story. And uh, there's, <laughs> for five or six months in early 2000, early and mid-2014, I had some interviews that I think were, um, were really, really worked. But I also think there is a sense out there that it's time to get this artwork back. And maybe with this book will help in that momentum. Maybe this buzz that my being out there, Anthony being out there, Anthony Moore being out there, Jeff Kelly, Mrs. Uh, Ann Hawley, the director of the museum being out there, talking about this. It will not it will not be a cold case. That's my fear. That this will be treated like, oh yes, there's artwork, oh yes, there's a half a billion dollars worth of art missing. Oh yes, we've lost the, the precious valuables of our uh, artistic achievements, but why should I get involved? And I think what the, the arguments that I'm making, that our gener your generation, your children's generation, and those generations after, unless there is a breakthrough now, that we may go a very long time before we get that back. Well, Stephen Kirkton, thank you very much for joining us today. Back to you in the studio.